Hey everyone, if you're new here, welcome. My name is Keisha and today I'm going to be talking about my most anticipated 2023 book releases. Today's video is going to be pretty chill. I'm going to be telling you guys about some of the books that I'm most excited for in 2023. I'm not going to tell you books that are going to be releasing throughout all 12 months of 2023, just through the first six months. Last year, I did these series of videos in quarters. So every quarter of the year, I would tell you the releases that I was looking forward to in the next three months. But I felt like it was a lot to try to do all those videos. So this year, instead of just doing four or one, I'm going to break it up into two. So today I'm going to be talking about January through June releases. And then in June, I will do another video talking about July through December releases. I've gotten pretty selective in the books that I choose to talk about in these videos because I always aim to make sure that I'm reading the books that I'm anticipating. I don't want to just put a lot of books out there um, or a lot of books that other people are talking about. I do try to find some that are ones that I will personally enjoy and maybe some hidden gems also. So today I have 19 books to talk to you guys about. Two of those are fantasy. Five of them are mysteries or thrillers. Five of them are romance. Two of them are horror. Three of them are middle grade and none of them are spooky middle grade, which is hilarious. But I have two middle grade graphic novels and then one middle grade, just like normal novel. And then I have two historical fiction that also have some subgenres that I'm interested in. And that is going to make up the 19 books that I'm talking to you about today. I am going to do them in the order of release date. So let's go ahead and get started with January. The first book that I want to talk to you guys about is Lost in the Moment and Found by Shauna McGuire. This is book eight in the Wayward Children series, which comes out on January 10th. This has been my longest continued series that I have just continued on with. So this is book eight and these are portal fantasy novellas. I don't read a lot of fantasy so I feel like the fact that I'm telling you guys about this one should maybe highlight it for you. I am not going to go into super detail about the synopsis of this one though I do believe it is a standalone um, so these series, you can read them in order or out of order, but I always like to read them in order. Some of them can be standalones and some of them will go into the series together. But I really think if you want to read these books that you should start from the first one because you'll understand the world a little bit better. So if you happen to not know what the Wayward Children series is about, essentially there is a home for Wayward Children, which is full of kids who have gone through these different doorways, whether that be an actual doorway or maybe through a tree or a chest or different things like that. And they find these worlds where they feel like they belong. And the reason that I feel like a lot of these kids end up in those worlds is because in their current situation, in their current life, they don't really feel like they fit in. So they find these worlds and for one reason or another, whether it be of their own choosing or they get thrown out, they end up coming back to the real world and they can't quite let go of the world that they have returned from. So a lot of them end up being sent to Miss West's home for wayward children. And she is either helping those children to find their doors again or to adjust back to the real world. Another book that comes out on January 10th is Liar, Dreamer, Thief by Maria Dong. This is a mystery thriller and I was initially drawn into this one because of the cover. Obviously it is a very unique one and it looks really interesting. It says Katrina Kim may be broke, the black sheep of her family and slightly unhinged, but she isn't a stalker. Her obsession with her coworker Kurt is just one of many coping mechanisms like her constant shape and number rituals or the way scenes from her favorite children's book bleed into her vision whenever she feels anxious or stressed. But when Katrina finds a cryptic message from Kurt that implies he's aware of her surveillance, her tenuous hold on a normal life crumbles. Driven by compulsion, she enacts the most powerful ritual she has to reclaim control, a midnight visit to the Cayatoga Bridge, and arrives just in time to witness Kurt's suicide. Before he jumps, he slams her with a devastating accusation. His death is all her fault. Horrified, Katrina combs through the clues she's collected about Kurt over the last three years, but each revelation uncovers a menacing truth. For every moment she was watching him, he was watching her. And the past she thought she'd left behind, it's been following her more closely than she could have ever imagined. This is a gripping page turner as well as a sensitive exploration of mental health. It's an intimate portrayal of a life in all of its complexities and the dangers inherent in unveiling people's most closely guarded secrets. 
I don't think I can say any more about this other than, wow, I cannot wait to read this one. There's so many elements here. Obviously, there may be some triggers to look into, especially since this deals with suicide. But just seeing that like these two characters stalked each other and what secrets they have that were unveiled and different things like that, it just sounds like a great book. The next book I have also comes out on January 10th, and it is The Rom-Com Agenda by Jane Denker. Now, this is obviously a romance book, if you couldn't already tell by the title, and it sounds like it's going to be a really cute one. It says it's vibrantly funny, endearingly sweet, and a love letter to all things rom-com. Step one, find yourself. Leah Keegan is used to being alone, especially after taking care of her sick foster mother for the past year, but now there's nothing keeping her in the sweet town of Willow Cove. It's time to move on, again. Step two, win back the one who got away. Eli Masterson thought he and Victoria were meant to be together until she decided to jet off to Rome for a year. Eli is determined to win her back, but how? Step three, become a romantic hero. Changing Eli's physical appearance is easy, but to turn Eli into the sophisticated yet vulnerable ideal man, his girl pals force him to watch classic rom-coms and take notes. Step four, fall in love. Inadvertently drawn into the makeover scheme, Leah ends up being Eli's guide through the wild world of meet cutes and grand gestures. Even though she believes Eli doesn't need to change a thing about himself. Even though she just might be falling for Eli and Eli falling for her. Does this not just sound like the perfect swoony second chance romance story? I mean, I love second chance romance. It says it's a little bit of a slow burn too. And rom-coms are always the best. I love when romance and characters have like a good banter and can make me laugh. So I'm definitely excited for this one. Moving on to January 17th, we have How to Sell a Haunted House by Grady Hendrix. This is a horror novel and I feel like most people are anticipating this one that enjoy the horror genre or Grady Hendrix's work. This one has been pushed back a couple of times. And so I know everybody is so excited for it to come out on the 17th. I will go ahead and read the synopsis for this one just in case you haven't heard it. But like I said, I know it's a pretty popular one. Every childhood home is haunted and each of us are possessed by our parents. When their parents die at the tail end of the coronavirus pandemic, Louise and Mark Joyner are devastated, but nothing can prepare them for how bad things are about to get. The two siblings are almost totally estranged and couldn't be more different. Now, however, they don't have a choice but to get along. The virus has passed and both of them are facing bank accounts ravaged by the economic meltdown. Their one asset, their childhood home. They need to get in on the market as soon as possible because they need the money. Yet before her parents died, they taped newspaper over the mirrors and nailed shut the attic door. Sometimes we feel like puppets controlled by our upbringing and our genes. Sometimes we feel like our parents treat us like toys or playthings or even dolls. The past can ground us, teach us, and keep us safe. It can also trap us and bond us and suffocate the life out of us. As disturbing events stack up in the house, Louise and Mark have to learn that sometimes the only way to break away from the past, the only way to sell a haunted house, is to burn it all down. I've really found that I've enjoyed Grady Hendrix's books lately. The first book that I read from him was The Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires, which I gave three stars. The next one that I read by him was The Final Girl Support Group, which I gave four stars. And most recently, I gave My Best Friend's Exorcism five stars, and it was one of my favorite books of last year. So I'm really hoping to keep on the high with his books and that I really enjoy How to Sell a Haunted House. Also on January 17th, we have a mystery novel called Everyone in My Family Has Killed Someone. The title of this one drew me in more than anything else, and then I heard it compared to, if you liked, The Seven or Seven and a Half Deaths of Evelyn Hardcastle by Stuart Turton, which I really enjoyed that one and gave it four stars. So that is really the reason why I added this one to my list. The synopsis says, Everyone in my family has killed someone. Some of us, the high achievers, have killed more than once. I'm not trying to be dramatic, but it's the truth. Some of us are good, others are bad, and some just unfortunate. I'm Ernest Cunningham. Call me Ern or Ernie. I wish I'd killed whoever decided our family reunion should be at a ski resort, but it's a little more complicated than that. Have I killed someone? Yes, I have. Who was it? Let's get started. Everyone in my family has killed someone. My brother, my stepsister, my wife, my father, my mother, my sister-in-law, my uncle, my stepfather, my aunt, and me. Also coming out on January 17th is 7% of Roe Dev Roe. This is a young adult contemporary romance, which I don't read a lot of, but I really love this cover and the synopsis really drew me in. This is a debut novel about a girl who must decide whether to pursue her dreams or preserve her relationships, including a budding romance with her ex-best friend when an app she creates goes viral. Roe Dev Roe can predict your future, or at least the app she built for her senior project can. Working with her neighbor, a retired behavioral scientist, Roe created an app called MASH 
designed around the classic game Mansion, Apartment, Shack, House. Now, I know all of you played this in school. Don't tell me you didn't. It can predict a person's future with 93% accuracy. The app will even match users with their soulmates. Though it was only supposed to be a class project, MASH quickly takes off and gains the attention of tech investors. Rose's dream is to work in Silicon Valley and she'll do anything to prove to her new backing company and the world that the app works. So it's a huge shock when the app says her soulmate is Miller, her childhood best friend with whom she had a friendship destroying fight three years ago. Now thrust into a fake dating scenario, Roe and Miller must address the years of pain between them if either of them will have any chance of achieving their dreams. It says this is for fans of Emma Lord, which I haven't read anything from Emma Lord, but I do have one of her books on my TBR. So this is obviously a childhood friends to lovers trope, which I absolutely love. It also has some fake dating thrown in there. So I'm really excited for this one and hoping that it's going to be one that I love. I'm really hoping that because it has a trope that I love, it will be a book that I love too. On January 24th, we have Do I Know You by Emily Wibberly and Austin Sigmund Broca. I believe these authors had another book that came out before this, or it may have just been Emily that had one come out. Um, I'm trying to remember what it was called. Oh, it was The Roughest Draft, which I haven't read that one, but there's a specific reason why I want to read this one. It has everything to do with the synopsis. When a couple starts to feel like they're married to a stranger, a flirtatious game of pretend becomes the spark they need to reignite their relationship. Eliza and Graham are anticipating an anything but sexy week-long getaway to celebrate their five-year anniversary. Nestled on the Northern California coastline, the resort prides itself on being a destination for those in love and those looking to find it. For Eliza and Graham, it might as well be a vacation with a roommate. When a well-meaning guest mistakes Eliza and Graham for being single and introduces them at the hotel bar, they don't correct him. Suddenly, they're pretending to be perfect strangers and it's unexpectedly fun? Eliza and Graham find themselves flirting like it's their first date and waiting with butterflies in their stomach for the other to text back. Everyone at the retreat can sense the electric chemistry between Eliza and Graham's alter egos, but when their scintillating game of role-playing ends, will they still feel the heat? This reminds me so much, not really because of this synopsis particularly, but this reminds me of Taylor Jenkins Reads After I Do, which was a story about a married couple who took a year off from each other to kind of decide if they were supposed to be together. I love this because I'm a married woman. So here's the deal. I love my husband. I wouldn't have it any other way. We will have been married for 10 years in May and that's just that. But it's so fun when you read a book that isn't all happy-go-lucky all the time because it's more realistic. So the fact that like this couple's been together for five years and they're like, I just feel like this is my roommate. We need another spark in our romance. That is very realistic in marriages. I think there's a lot of times in life where you just start going through the motions and you're like, we need a little bit of spice back. So I love books like this because as a married woman, I feel like I can relate to some of the things that are talked about. So I'm really excited for this one because I love that they're gonna be doing a little bit of role playing to kind of get that spark back. I just think it sounds so cute and definitely one that I'm really looking forward to. The last book that I have on my list for January also comes out on the 24th and this one is The Minuscule Mansion of Myra Malone. This is a fantasy novel that says it has some magical realism and romance and it says from her attic in the Arizona mountains 34 year old Myra Malone blogs about a dollhouse mansion that captivates thousands of readers worldwide. Myra's stories have created legions of fans who breathlessly await every blog post, trade photographs of mansion modeled rooms, and swap theories about the enigmatic and reclusive author. Myra herself is tethered to the mansion by mysteries she can't understand, rooms that appear and disappear overnight, music that plays in its corridors. Across the country, Alex Rakes, the scion of a custom furniture business, encounters two mansion fans trying to recreate a room. The pair show him the minuscule mansion and Alex is shocked to recognize a reflection of his own life mirrored back to him in minute scale. The room is his own bedroom and the mansion is his family's home, handed down from the grandmother who disappeared mysteriously when Alex was a child. Searching for answers, Alex begins corresponding with Myra. Together, the two unwind the lonely paths of their twin worlds, big and small, and trace the stories that entwine them, setting the stage for a meeting rooted in loss, but defined by love. This sounds so unique to anything that I've ever read. It's got a little bit of everything. It sounds like it's got a little bit of fantasy and a little bit of mystery with also a little bit of romance. And it just sounds like the perfect mashup for a good story. Moving on to February, I only have one book that I'm looking forward to this month and it is a mystery thriller that comes out on February 21st. 
and it is called The Writing Retreat by Julia Bartz. It says, the plot meets please join us in this psychological suspense debut about a young author at an exclusive writer's retreat that descends into a nightmare. Alex has all but given up on her dreams of becoming a published author when she receives a once in a lifetime opportunity. Attend an exclusive month long writing retreat at the estate of feminist horror writer Rosa Velo. Even the knowledge that Wren, her former best friend and current rival is attending doesn't dampen her excitement. But when the attendees arrive, Rosa drops a bombshell. They must all complete an entire novel from scratch during the next month, and the author of the best one will receive a life-changing seven-figure publishing deal. Determined to win this seemingly impossible contest, Alex buckles down and tries to ignore the strange happenings at the estate, including Rosa's erratic behavior, Wren's cruel mind games, and the alleged haunting of the mansion itself. But when one of the writers vanishes during a snowstorm, Alex realizes that something very sinister is afoot. With the clock running out, she's desperate to discover the truth and save herself. This is a claustrophobic and propulsive thriller exploring the dark side of friendships and fame. I feel like there have been a lot of books written that have to do with a writer's retreat. Um, I think Kill Creek might be one of those. And then there's another one. I can't really remember what it's called at the moment. But there's another one that has something to do with writers going out. I feel like there's been a few, but I haven't read any yet. And this one sounds really good. So I definitely wanted to add it to my list. Moving into March, I have a middle grade graphic novel that comes out on the 7th, and this is The Moth Keeper by Kay O'Neill. This is the same author of the Tea Dragon Society series as well as Aquacorn Cove. I love those novels so much, and I'm really excited to see a new book from this author. It says, being a moth keeper is a huge responsibility and a great honor, but what happens when the new moth keeper decides to take a break from the moon and see the sun for the first time? Anya is finally a moth keeper, the protector of the lunar moths that allow the night lily flower to bloom once a year. Her village needs the flower to continue thriving and Anya is excited to prove her worth and show her thanks to her friends with her actions. But what happens when being a moth keeper isn't exactly what Anya thought it would be. The nights are cold in the desert and the lunar moths live far from the village. Anya finds herself isolated and lonely. Despite Anya's dedication, she wonders what it would be like to live in the sun. Her thoughts turn into an obsession, and when Anya takes a chance to stay up during the day to feel the sun's warmth, her village and the lunar moths are left to deal with the consequences. This novel is filled with magic, hope, and friendship, and it's about passion, duty, and a found family. The next book I have for March comes out on the 21st, and this is The London Seance Society by Sarah Penner. This is the same author that wrote The Lost Apothecary, which I believe I read about two years ago. I know it's been a while since she has had a published novel. And I really liked The Lost Apothecary. I gave it four stars, but it wasn't super memorable for me. So I want to give this author another try and see if maybe I like this one better or if I'm going to vibe with her books or not because I know I've gotten a little bit pickier since then. So we'll just have to see. But this one says, May mercy be upon the man who finds himself the enemy of a vengeful medium. 1873. At an abandoned chateau on the outskirts of Paris, a dark seance is about to take place. Led by acclaimed spiritualist Vaudelon Dallaire, Dallaire, I cannot say these names, <laughs> known worldwide for her talent in conjuring the spirits of murder victims to ascertain the identities of the people who killed them, she is highly sought after by widows and investigators alike. Lena Wicks has come to Paris to find answers about her sister's death, but to do so, she must embrace the unknown and overcome her own logic-driven bias against the occult. When Vaudelon is beckoned to England to solve a high-profile murder, Lena accompanies her as an understudy. But as the women team up with the powerful men of London's exclusive seance society to solve the mystery, they begin to suspect that they are not merely out to solve a crime, but perhaps entangled in one themselves. The last book that I have on my list for March comes out on the 28th, and this is A House with Good Bones by T. Kingfisher. I still haven't read a novel by this author. I do have one on my list, and that is The Hollow Places, which I'm not sure if I'm going to like or not. Oh, I actually have another one. It's A Wizard's Guide to Defensive Baking, which I think reads a little bit like a middle grade. So I have those on my list, but this one really piqued my interest, so I wanted to add it too. It is a horror novel with a little bit of a Southern Gothic feel. It says, Mom seems off. Her brother's words echo in Sam Montgomery's ear as she turns onto the quiet North Carolina street where their mother lives alone. She brushes the thought away as she climbs the front steps. Sam's excited for this rare extended visit and looking forward to nights with just the two of them, drinking boxed wine, watching murder mystery shows, and guessing who the killer is long before the characters figure it out. But stepping inside, she quickly realizes home isn't what it used to be. Gone is the warm, cluttered charm her mom is known for. Now the walls are painted a sterile white. Her mom jumps at the smallest noises and looks over her shoulder even when she's the only person in the room. And when Sam steps out back to clear her head, 
she finds a jar of teeth hidden beneath the magazine worthy rose bushes and vultures are circling the garden from above. To find out what's got her mom so frightened in her own home, Sam will go digging for the truth, but some secrets are better left buried. Moving into April, we have probably my most anticipated release for the first six months of the year, and it comes out on April 4th, and this is The Soulmate by Sally Hepworth. I really loved two of Sally Hepworth's books this past year, and I'm really excited to read more from her. She is marketed as a thriller author, but I would go as far to say that she writes more suspense and family dramas. Now, I may be wrong. This one may be more thrilling, but I just like to tell people that going in, just in case you haven't read from her before, that it doesn't really feel as thrilling as some other thrillers. It's more family drama and suspense. There's a cottage on a cliff, Gabe and Pippa's dream home in a sleepy coastal town, but their perfect house hides something sinister. The tall cliffs have become a popular spot for people to end their lives. Night after night, Gabe comes to their rescue, literally talking them off the ledge until he doesn't. When Pippa discovers Gabe knew the victim, the questions spiral. Did the victim jump? Was she pushed? And would Gabe, the love of Pippa's life, her soulmate, lie? As the perfect facade of their marriage begins to crack, the deepest and darkest secrets begin to unravel. That sounds so juicy and so good, and I cannot wait for this one. Next up is a novel I've come up on more recently. It also comes out on the 4th, and this is a historical fiction novel, but it also has some elements of gothic stories, fantasy, and mystery. Also, maybe a little bit paranormal. This is The Last Heir to Blackwood Library by Hester Fox. In post-World War I England, a young woman inherits a mysterious library and must untangle its powerful secrets. With the stroke of a pen, 23-year-old Ivy Radcliffe becomes Lady Hayworth owner of a sprawling estate on the Yorkshire Moors. Ivy has never heard of Blackwood Abbey or of the ancient bloodline from which she's descended. With nothing to keep her in London since losing her brother in the Great War, she warily makes her way to her new home. The Abbey is foreboding, the servants reserved and suspicious, but there's a treasure waiting behind locked doors, a magnificent library. Despite cryptic warnings from the staff, Ivy feels irresistibly drawn to its dusty shelves where familiar works mingle with strange esoteric text, and she senses something else in the library too a presence that seems to have a will of its own. Rumors swirl in the village about the Abbey's previous owners, about ghosts and curses, and an enigmatic manuscript at the center of it all. And as events grow more sinister, it will be up to Ivy to uncover the library's mysteries in order to reclaim her own story before it vanishes forever. This is a skillful reflection to memory and female agency and a love letter to books from a writer at the height of her power. This sounds really, really interesting, and I don't read a lot of historical books, but the fact that this revolves around a library makes me even more interested, and the fact that there are some mysteries surrounding this library in this home makes me even more excited. Moving into May, I only have one book for this month also, and it is actually a sequel to a middle grade graphic novel series that I've only read the first book in, and this is the third book, so I'm not going to go into the synopsis of the third one, but it is called Secrets and Sidekicks, and this is the third book in the Katie the Cat Sitter series. It is a middle grade graphic novel that is really cute. Like I said, I read the first one, and I still really want to read the second. I just don't have it, so I haven't read it yet. And this is by Colleen A.F. Venable and Stephanie Yu, and it comes out on May 1st. So I'm going to go ahead and tell you about Katie the Cat Sitter so you know that. So essentially, Katie the Cat Sitter is dreading this really boring summer that she is coming up on. Um, and she ends up wanting to go to camp with one of her friends, but she doesn't have the money. So in order to save up money to go to this camp, she starts being a cat sitter for this lady. And while all this is going on, there's also like this vigilante that's going through the town that the police are trying to catch. Think like Arrow. He's not really doing bad things. He's doing good things, but he's looked at as a bad guy. So somebody like this is going around and actually doing a lot of good acts, but they're looked at as bad acts because they're having to break the law in a sense to do the good things. So that's going on also in Katie is getting really curious about that and it's just a really fun story and I'm excited to see how the series progresses. Moving on to the last few books. These are all coming out in June and the first one is a romance book coming out on June 6th. It is called Double Decker Dreams by Lindsay McMillan. It says it's perfect for fans of Josie Silver and Sophie Cousins, which I've read one book by Josie Silver and I really enjoyed that. And I have two of Sophie Cousins books on my list to read. So I feel like this might be a good author for me to try out. American consultant Kat is staffed on a six month project in London and has two very small, very reasonable ambitions before returning home. Get promoted to partner and fall in love with a handsome English aristocrat. No problem, right? But work is a grind and the British men she meets are a far cry from her royal ideal. 
Then one morning she sees a man on a double decker bus and just knows that he's her person. But when Kat finally musters the courage to board the bus and introduce herself, he turns out to be very different from the Prince Charming she expected. Can Kat open herself up to a love that's not like the movies, or is she too imprisoned by her rom-com expectations? And just as importantly, will she be able to see that success isn't about landing a C-suite job, but rather living a life that's aligned with her soul? Readers looking for a charming, modern love story will be smitten with this sharp, emotionally resonant roller coaster ride through the heart of London. This really reminds me of One Day in December by Josie Silver because it is a love at first sight situation um, that looks a little bit different than this one, but it's somebody is singing on a bus and they just know it's their person, yada, yada, yada. It's the same kind of concept, but it turns out a little bit differently and maybe a little bit more realistic. So I'm really excited to see how this one turns out and maybe it'll be a new favorite. I don't know. I've not heard anybody talk about this one yet, so I'm really excited to see if it's a good one. Next up, I have the book that everybody will be talking about this year and that everybody is already talking about. It comes out on June 20th and that is Riley Sager's new book, The Only One Left. So I still have um, the book that he came out with last year, The House Across the Lake, that I have to read. And I'm hoping to read that one before this one comes out. So hopefully I'll be able to get to it. Some of his books have been like hit or miss for me. My favorites of his are The Last Time I Lied and Home Before Dark. I think I might like The House Across the Lake too, but I'm just going to have to try it and see. This one sounds really good though. It is a gothic chiller about a young caregiver assigned to work for a woman accused of a Lizzie Borden-like massacre decades earlier. At 17, Lenora Hope hung her sister with a rope. Now reduced to a schoolyard chant, the Hope family murders shocked the Maine coast one bloody night in 1929. While most people assume 17-year-old Lenora was responsible, the police were never able to prove it. Other than her denial after the killing, she has never spoken publicly about that night, nor has she set foot outside Hope's End the cliffside mansion where the massacre occurred. Stabbed her father with a knife, took her mother's happy life. It's now 1983 and home health aide Kit McDear arrives at a decaying Hope's Inn to care for Lenora after her previous nurse fled in the middle of the night. In her 70s and confined to a wheelchair, Lenora was rendered mute by a series of strokes and can only communicate with Kit by typing out sentences on an old typewriter. One night, Lenora uses it to make a tantalizing offer. I want to tell you everything. It wasn't me, Lenora said, but she's the only one not dead. As Kit helps Lenora write about the events leading to the Hope family massacre, it becomes clear there's more to the tale than people know. But when new details about her predecessor's departure come to light, Kit starts to suspect Lenora might not be telling the complete truth and that the seemingly harmless woman in her care could be far more dangerous than she first thought. This has all the elements of a story that I love. I love the unreliable narrator situation. I love that you get a little bit of a time jump, not much, but you get a little bit of a time jump from when the murders happen and to now. I love that Lenora is typing out and writing and telling her story to Kit and trying, and Kit is trying to discern whether or not to believe her. I just think it sounds really, really good. Next up, also coming out on June 20th, is a middle grade novel. I am not quite sure yet if I'm super excited for this one, but like it's the closest to a spooky middle grade that I could come to. I saw the cover of it and it says Ghost Town and I was like, okay, wait, what is this? So this is 102 Days of Lying About Lauren by Maura Jortner. After being abandoned by her mother in a most unusual place, a defiant heroine sticks to her plan for staying hidden, even though getting caught could mean saving her life. 12-year-old Mouse calls an amusement park home. Nobody notices her, and that's the way she likes it. Mouse sweeps the streets and wears a uniform she borrowed and sleeps on the top floor of the haunted house of horrors. She knows which security guards to avoid, eats the bagel left out each morning for the ghosts of summer, a popular theme park legend, and even has the taco guy convinced that her lunch is paid for. She has her special hiding methods down to a science. But one morning, a girl named Kat comes looking for Lauren Susnick. Kat notices her and Mouse doesn't like it. Mouse cannot let this nosy pest find out who she really is. If Mouse gets discovered living in the park, Mama might come back for her. And Mouse doesn't want that. Or even worse, Mama might not come back at all. Mouse knows she can lose this girl without blowing her cover. She just has to follow her rules. A carefully constructed life in the park is all she needs, right? Anchored by memorable characters and an extraordinary setting, Mara Jortner's brilliant debut novel is bursting with grit, humor, and heart. So I have no idea where this novel is gonna go, but I feel like it's definitely gonna have some hard hitting elements to figure out why Lauren wants to stay at this theme park and what is going on with her. So I'm really excited to check this one out. I guess like I, it just took me reading the synopsis to get reinterested. 
Okay, we are at the last book, and I already said that I think the one I'm most anticipating is The Soulmate, but I might equally be anticipating The Seven Year Slip by Ashley Poston, which comes out on June 27th. And the reason why is because this author wrote The Dead Romantics, which was my number three top book of last year that I read, and I loved it so much. So, this is a romance, and it says, an overworked book publicist with a perfectly planned future hits a snag when she falls in love with her temporary roommate only to discover he lives seven years in the past. What? Okay, see, now I don't even know. I don't even know if like, which one is gonna be the most anticipated for me now. Probably this one. Sometimes the worst day of your life happens and you have to figure out how to live after it. So Clementine forms a plan to keep her heart safe. Work hard, find someone decent to love and try to remember to chase the moon. The last one is silly and obviously metaphorical, but her aunt always told her that you needed at least one big dream to keep going. And for the last year, that plan has gone off without a hitch, mostly. The love part is hard because she doesn't want to get too close to anyone. She isn't sure her heart can take it. And then she finds a strange man standing in the kitchen of her late aunt's apartment. A man with kind eyes and a southern drawl and a taste for lemon pies. The kind of man that before it all, she would have fallen head over heels for, and she might again except he exists in the past, seven years ago to be exact, and she quite literally lived seven years in his future. Her aunt always said the apartment was a pinch in time, a place where moments blended together like watercolors, and Clementine knows that if she lets her heart fall, she'll be doomed. After all, love is never a matter of time, but a matter of timing. Okay, yeah, this is, this is, this is it. The last one that I've mentioned today, this is it. This is my most anticipated for the first six months of the year. That sounds so good. And this better be as good as the Dead Romantics because I love that one. And this one sounds so good. And I just want to know what happens. And it just, oh, does that not, I feel like this guy, I don't know who, what his name is or anything else. I don't think it says, but he might be a new book boyfriend already because I mean, given he lived seven years in the past, so that's a little inconvenient, but he has a Southern drawl, kind eyes and a taste for lemon pies. I mean, Okay, I'm really excited for that one. And we are finally at the end of this video. If you made it this far, thank you so, so much. I know this was a little bit long. I read you all these synopses, but I feel like when you're introducing new books, sometimes the best way to do it is just to go ahead and give somebody the full synopses. So hopefully I was able to introduce you to some new books today. If you made it this far in the video, go ahead and leave a heart emoji down below because of that last book, because my heart is like, I'm so excited. Thank you again for watching. If you want to let me know what book you are really anticipating for the new year, please go ahead and leave that in the comments as well. Or if you know about some books that maybe I didn't mention here and you want to make sure that I know about, go ahead and leave those down below as well. I hope you all have a great day or night wherever you are and I will see you in my next video. Bye!